All right, I am Carol Jones. I am the librarian at Shawnee Middle School. And I'm gonna be sharing with you some about our process of teaching research skills um, based around the Tulsa Race Massacre. And we use the guided inquiry process. So we're gonna kind of flip back and forth between the process and the content. And I'll be able to share some resources with you that hopefully you can do some of the same things in your classes. All right, so just to kind of get your feet wet and start thinking along um, this process and this even just this topic of inquiry, I wanted you to think about what your current level of knowledge on the Tulsa Race Massacre is. So maybe you're just starting to explore it because it's the 100th anniversary and it's interesting to you, or you already know some facts, but you are more interested in the whole process of introducing it to your students, or you've already started teaching it, maybe just in the last year, um, because of course, with the 100th anniversary, that makes it, um, kind of a topic of concern to students and teachers. Um, or three, where you've already, no, we've talked about that. Uh, four, where you've already taught it several years. And that's kind of where we are at my school. Um, this year, we're in our third year, and we have definitely made some, some improvements every year. And then of course, had to make some changes with COVID this year. Um, then five, you could really be kind of an insider where you have family who have lived through this, but still as a teacher, you want to be able to share it with your students. Okay, so looking at the whole process that we used, we used guided inquiry design as kind of a, a research tool and a research guide for our students. Carol Coolthaw is some of the main thought process behind this, um, but Leslie, her daughter, was also very, um, instrumental in how do you guide students through that process. Most of Carol Kulthal's research was how do students um, kind of adjust and evaluate themselves as learners. And Leslie has dug more into how did we make that an actual step-by-step -step thing that then teachers can implement. So it's really a great um, resource. And then Anne Kaspari was also a co-author with them. And my school has actually done an institute with Leslie after we um, tried <laughs> guided inquiry without whole lots of guidance. So we'll talk about that in a minute. The two links I have there for you are like this, just this general information link about guided inquiry and how you would use it in research. And then the blog itself, Leslie pulls in um, groups of teachers, teams of teachers who have taught through the process. And in February of this year, uh, the team at Shawnee Middle School shared every week different steps and different um, takeaways in this particular unit for us. All right, so here is kind of the framework or the, the general progression of how do you get students to do research? Obviously you want to engage them, you've got to hook them. That's been our biggest kind of um, maybe worry in that we want students to all engage on some level so that opening phase is pretty crucial. Then of course you want to immerse them in as much and as many different ways of exposure. And then we're gonna talk through the rest of these two where you'll notice here, she's got some that look like you're kind of dropping back because like an explorer, you're sort of asking them to be more specific rather than this immerse where they're really broad and how they are addressing the topic. Then of course, in the identify phase, it's a little higher than immerse as far as you know leveling of what they're actually doing. Um, but you also want them to decide how am I going to do my research? What am I really looking for? Or at least go toward that decision because lots of them will still maybe tweak it along the way as they start exploring more. The gather phase is where they're trying to get resources together, get um, information together that supports that question they've identified. Um, I will tell you too later that uh, that identifying the question seemed to be really hard for some of our students. Some of them right off the bat had something they wanted to question, but many of them had trouble putting it in question form so that it was something they could really research. Then your whole create process is right along there with sharing because that's kind of the product they're putting together, their end way of showing what they've learned and sharing that. That's why share and create are so closely linked there because the whole creation process, what we really want to do is provide an authentic audience for them so that they're motivated to do well with the create piece so that when they're sharing something, they, they feel value in what they've done. 
Then of course the evaluate process, I was surprised at how many students um, really did learn stuff about themselves. And I think it was through this process because there's a lot of journaling and reflection that they were able to, to vocalize what they had learned about themselves as learners. Okay, this is kind of in depth about our opening phase and you'll see this poster for the opening phase that really this is where we're inviting them like, what did you really learn? What did you really, um, we're inviting them to, to want to learn, not what did you already learn. Um, we want to kind of open up their, their horizons. We want them to um, get engaged with the information, but we also want them to just be curious and ask any question that they can think of, maybe related to the topic, but sometimes not exactly related. We really just want them curious enough to engage. And this is kind of what we did in our open phase. Um, we did some podcasts, we did some TED Talks. We um, looked at the first Thanksgiving <laughs> that was supposed to be based on what happened in 1621. And the painting was done, I think in the 19-teens, like 1913, 1914. And so there's a lot you can talk about with assumptions there. Then also we had them reflect on, especially the journal piece of this was, when have I actually had people making assumptions about me or have I had people making assumptions about me? We want them to start recognizing where those are happening. And we're exposing them to lots of general ideas. So I just gathered some here on the side, like what are some places where people can say assumptions have been made about me? And so these were some interesting ones that I thought students would engage with. And then I also gave you the link there where you can, you can look and see and dig what into what your students might also be interested in. All right, the immerse phase gets a little deeper, but it's also pretty broad and wide. Um, so this is not the absolute deep dive, but this is more information, more background. Um, how did this event come about? Like, what do I know about Greenwood? And they also read the novel Dreamland Burning, um, though we are um, evaluating maybe if that's gonna always be the novel or if we're gonna give students a choice um, or if we're gonna change it completely. So like I said, our team keeps reflecting and um, we're definitely still tweaking as we go to improve things. Um, so we're really here. You want them to get connected. You want them to engage with the content a little further and you want them to be so curious that they're finding all these interesting ideas like almost rabbit trails. You're kind of encouraging that in this immerse phase because Immerse is still not exactly where they're ultra specific to their topic. A lot of kids will have identified their question by here. You don't, you don't say, no, you can't identify the question because we're not at identify yet. There's a lot of overlapping that can happen in your steps. This is a display that we borrowed from the Tulsa Historical Society as part of this Immerse phase. This is also a, the um, optic where we ask students questions related to these panels. We use these panels several different ways. This is a wonderful resource from the Tulsa Histor Historical Society. They allow schools to schedule and borrow them. Um, and we've done that twice, but many thanks to K-20, um, a research grant, I was able to obtain a set for our school. And you'll see the lovely panels behind me because um, the panels are just so wonderfully done. There's one side that focuses on the massacre and this, the first side really focuses on Greenwood and its prosperity and how it was established and um, just the history of Greenwood in general leading up to. And then there are some panels that deal with basically Greenwood's rebuilding and Greenwood's coming out of this tragic event. Then the explore phase is really where you want students to, to look at what the things are that they have found are most interesting to them. So they're looking around, some places they might start digging in a little deeper and that's natural, uh, especially those students who just like automatically find what their question is. But again, we, we use lots of different resources. We didn't only focus on the massacre, though that was the primary way we got them thinking about and talking about assumptions and the damage they do in our society. Um, we also tried to bring them into more current events. And so you'll see in the wakelet I'll share with you in a minute that
that there are several recent news articles um, that students can associate with assumptions. And so we want to provide them with as much resources as we can to help them look for a question that they want to further investigate after they've kind of experienced the beginning parts of this unit. Um, on this particular aspect of the process, they're, they're really digging in, they're looking around, they haven't necessarily had to identify their question yet, but a lot of students, like I said, will have gotten to that point and they just automatically know where they've seen assumptions and what they want to explore more fully. So this particular wakelet, this is just the front page of our um, wakelet. And so you'll see, we posted some things about the Capitol riot. We posted some things about um, Cameron Russell and her TED talk, um, some things about specific to the uh, race massacre. And specifically, we had lots of links to primary sources like arrest records and also podcasts from survivors that uh, are just incredibly moving to hear and students really do engage with them. This is the cover of the book and that is also seems to be very engaging for students. There's a lot of mystery and investigation in the storyline. So our students have really discussed a lot of what they see going on with um, the teenagers in this story. In the identify phase, that is where you want them to really start focusing and really start deciding what's gonna be my, my target of research. And like I said, some students struggled with this, like they wanted to say that the assumption was um, pit bulls or horrible dogs to own or dangerous dogs to own. And it was hard to get them through the process where what is it that's your question how do you make this into something you want to research and defend or present? So um, it's kind of hard for some of them to make that leap because they wanted to just state the assumption outright or that like video games are a waste of time. That was another research project for um, a student. And so we tried to back it up and get them to start asking like, what kind of question could you ask? Like, what are some positive things that come out of video gaming or um, maybe with the whole pit bull ownership, like does the actions of the owner have more to do with the personality or behavior of the dog versus just this automatic um, assumption that pit bulls are dangerous dogs. That just happened to be one of the, our other um, pretty, pretty di deep digging for one of our students. We also had another student who actually because of some friends and some family that he had, he actually interviewed several homeless people downtown. And so he actually talked about what are some inaccurate assumptions that we make about homelessness and about people who find themselves uh, living homelessly. Um, so he really, uh, his teacher said that he had not really completed anything all year, but this was actually something that he fully invested in. In this identify phase two, this is where we pull in some mini lessons. This year we had to do some pivoting because there were so many students quarantined at different points of this. There were also, um, due to some of the quarantining, the classes were at different places. So rather than like I did in years past, go in and do all the English classes on keyword research that particular day, I actually recorded um, a screencastify video about the keyword searching and how do you track what you're finding and how do you time to change classes when school is in session so how do you actually um monitor what you're finding at different places so that you can then reflect back and know if that's going to be valuable to you as a source then the painting that you see here is the um boston massacre and it is um, an incredible story to talk about plagiarism. So it works really well for students to realize that the painting that we all know and recognize, the one that's on the page here was a plagiarized piece. And uh, that kind of shakes some of them <laughs> that um, Paul Revere would do this to a friend. So we reflect on that. We talk about 
not taking other people's um, intellectual property and sharing it as your own, <laughs> even if you did make some minor tweaks to it. In the gather phase, this is where we really focus on um, specific resources. So um, like the Oklahoma Digital Prairie has lots of lovely um, pieces where there are um, primary sources. You can see actual arrest records. You can see newspaper articles that came out at the time. And we start talking with the students about what do you see here as bias? Do you see bias? Um, that kind of thing. And we gather all the links that we have used and referred to in our wakelet. So the wakelet is growing. You'll see that I have several pages to just make sure that we took pictures of the information so that you could see the kind of information that we were sharing with our students. I also gave you the link here where you could look and see uh, what kinds of things we put there because they are not all related to racism. They're not all related to the Tulsa Race Massacre. Lots of them are because you see that same thing with like the treatment of Japanese Americans um, around World War II. So students start really digging in and finding that this same mentality has kind of pervaded our country. And so they, um, they find lots of ways to interpret that and then apply it to something they wanna learn about. This is what our wakelet looks like. I have three pages here kind of superimposed upon one another, just so you can see the types of things. There's some survivor stories. You can see the arrest records that I've been talking about and the newspaper articles that relate to the coverage of um, the massacre in the days right after. But we also talk about what kind of coverage has it gotten recently and, and why that there's renewed interest. Um, and of course, we just we explore lots of the articles related to um, reparations and the talks about that so that students just get full exposure before they start asking their specific questions. So once they have gathered their information, we then let them pretty quickly choose what they want to present or how they want to present their findings. And this is just their choice board. Each one of them you'll see has a link underneath so that they have the rubric that's related to that particular product. Um, and the students really have found a lot of pride in the research that they put into this and the time and effort they put into this. They, um, most of them of course don't, don't choose the research paper, but it's incredible the number of them who basically do a radio quality podcast um, because they, they make these detailed outlines, they know exactly what they want to say. And we have some that are like 15 minute podcasts by students that are just incredible to listen to. Some of them basically formatted it like a talk show and they had other people asking them questions about the research, which means at least three other people <laughs> had to know their research and have educated questions to ask them and engage. It's been a really interesting thing to see what they come up with. A lot of them um, do kind of a poster or even a slide deck, but several of them also then went and recorded videos related to what they had found. Um, and I'll show you in a minute what we do to share that information and to make it um, available to an authentic audience. All right, so in the sharing phase, students create um, basically a flyer that gives just a few sentences about their project. It gives their QR code that then links you to whatever the project is and wherever it is. Some of them are on the podcast site. Some of them are part of our Google Drive. But once they've done this amount of research, we usually do this over six to eight weeks. And once they've put that much time in, most of them are pretty passionate <laughs> about their topic. And they're also pretty passionate that other people need to hear about it. So it's kind of interesting to see that for them. And we also, one of the, well, the first few years we did this and eighth grade students lead their own parent-teacher conference. And so this is part of what they're sharing at that conference. And we had posters posted around the um, eighth grade hallways so that other students and parents could um, link to the QR codes to see the research that other people had done. This year, again, we had to make that whole COVID pivot. And so we um, had it basically digitally on a bulletin board and we are still kind of evaluating because it's almost like we had more engagement because 
students have gone back to visit these things. And so I don't know that it's necessarily more, but there's been a longer time that it's available. And so they're, they're looking at other people's information and research even on the weekends and stuff. So it's interesting to see that progression of interest. These are some examples of things that students have researched. Some are on like the inequity in pay according to gender. Some are on like addictions and alcohol. Um, you'll see here one about the Japanese internment camps and the treatment of Japanese Americans um, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And then a lot of them do kind of tend to go toward the whole racism um, topic because it's very current events. It's still applicable today. You see those same attitudes happening. And so it's concerning to students. Then we have other students who kind of just branch out like the one with our pro athletes paid too much. And he really explored um, talking about the quantity of money that a pro athlete is paid versus the number of people in poverty. So it was interesting to see that. And then we have several who were interested in the rights of transgender persons and also um, uh, several LGBTQ um, topics. Because again, it's a current topic, it's applicable to their lives. And so they just dig in and go with what it is interesting to them. These are some more. The one on the far right is a pretty in-depth look at the Tulsa Race Massacre. Um, but then there are others that just really branched out like, um, what about the diversity training that companies hold? Is that effective? And so that's the one you'll see in the very bottom there. And then um, one of our students who's very sports oriented, oriented, he kind of piggybacked with the gender gap in pay. He um, did that versus with the NBA versus the WNBA. So that was also an interesting topic. And then the one um, right above the flags, she basically was trying to explore why celebrities kind of get away with doing things that, that the general population wouldn't, that are unethical, that are um, rude to other people, <laughs> that are, of course, she said racist here, but also there are several times that it's, it's along gender lines and the discrimination there or the mistreatment of others. And so, she really, when she reflected, she talked about that she wished there was more information out there. And maybe she would have changed her topic if she had realized how difficult it would be to find research that backed up that question. But then in the end, she said, I really wanted to know why this happens and why do we allow it? So that was still a question she ultimately wanted to ask, but it was, it was very difficult for her to dig in and find actual research to answer that question. Then one of the things that we really want them to take away and to learn is how do I know myself better as a learner? Um, so what is it that helped um, me be engaged with other people's projects? What is it that helped me um, be intrigued by certain questions or dig deeper in certain areas. So we use Flipgrid for that. And these are the Flipgrid questions we gave them. Um, like what worked for you? What surprised you? Um, and we tried to be pretty general. So we didn't wanna say what specifically surprised you about your research or what specifically surprised you about whatever. We wanted them to take that in a more general way and to run with that so that they were, they were interpreting like what was surprising or what worked. So it was interesting to hear the different ways they answer these questions. Then of course we asked them, what did you learn about the topic? But what did you also learn about just doing research or yourself as a researcher, yourself as a learner? And then this question of what would you change next time? That was a big question. And uh, it was interesting to hear them really decide either their project was great or the girl in the bottom with the cactus said she had done all this research and she did. She's won um, National History Day um, for the state. So she is really an incredible researcher 
but she really felt like after she reflected on this that um, a podcast might not have been the best presentation of her research. She felt like there probably needed to be some visual and not only a podcast. So she does evaluate herself as a presenter of her research. Her research was great, but she just didn't feel like podcast was maybe what she would have chosen if she did this again. Um, then we have several students who have investigated like the diversity training um, and then the stories of survivors and then um, the one about sports players being overpaid was a good bit of research there. And his biggest takeaway was that he um, wished he had taken it more seriously earlier in the project because once he started digging in, he realized he wanted a quality project, but he had kind of blown it off for probably half the time. And so you hear him say, I wish I, wish I had paid better attention. I wish I had invested more early in the project. And then the girl who did the survivors of the massacre um, it's interesting the perspective I have. I had her in sixth grade as a science student and then to see the investigation she did in eighth grade is really incredible. But um, she talks about it and she talks about her project and then she ultimately decides, I just did a great job. I don't need to change anything. And honestly, she did do a really good job. So it's interesting to hear their perspectives of how deep they will criticize themselves, but also how deep they'll think on what I would change or not change. These are some resources for your classroom. There are several here. The ones that are at the very top are basically things that have come out of Tulsa. So like we have the John Hope Franklin Reconciliation Center, and then we have the Tulsa Historical Society's virtual exhibit, which practically, well, it does encompass everything on these panels. So if you are, out of state or if you are in the panhandle or you are so far that driving to Tulsa to pick up those panels just doesn't work for you, they have everything in a virtual exhibit, which is very valuable. Then um, Tulsa Public Schools has done some incredibly detailed lesson plans related to the massacre and to Greenwood. And it's pretty amazing that they really have all grade levels covered. So basically pre-K through 12th grade. And um, just the reflection I've done with some other teams uh, with the Tulsa Race Massacre Educator Institute from Restorative Justice. Um, they actually have some time for us to dig in and reflect with groups of teachers. And it's amazing how many aspects they bring in, but you'll, you'll have seen that even our students, our art students did the display that was there for the author and they were, like referred back to these pictures. They wanted it to be as accurate as possible. And um, it was amazing to see the effort they put into that. Then restorative justice, the Restorative Justice Institute is going to be offering Zoom sessions related to um, using this kind of content in your classroom, but also how to do this based on your positionality as far as a teacher or anything in your past that Obviously, we all bring our paths to anything we teach and um, how we also look for trauma triggering information in our students and how we address that. So, and, and that has been a big learning experience for us too in this um, unit and repeating it. We have dropped some things, we have added some things, we have changed the way we have students process some things. So it really is going to, um, involve your team talking about how your students can do this, but also we evaluate basically weekly in team meetings to decide what's working, what's not working. Is there something we need to just immediately stop or that we need immediately need to slow down in a certain place or bring in something different? And the link at the very bottom is the um, guided inquiry unit that we did on the Tulsa Race Massacre. That's our outline and our um, basically our assignment of duties and which class or which teacher or which other person is going to bring in this particular resource and which person is going to be needed for that resource. It's a very detailed outline and it's been a very helpful piece that um, Leslie Maniotis with the Guided Inquiry Design 
has, has put together for teachers who are using this process.